What price would you pay for ultimate freedom? Would you work on a pot farm in the mountains of California, take LSD for days on end? And if your boss took everything from you, would that justify murder? In 2016, reporter Sam Anderson discovered one of his high school classmates had been arrested for murder. Sam's friends all said that Zach Wooster could have never killed anyone. So what happened? To find out, Sam headed to the legendary mountains of the Emerald Triangle, where he discovered Zach had joined a group of misfits drawn into the orbit of a pot grower obsessed with psychedelic drugs. In a search for an off-the-grid paradise, they instead found themselves in Lord of the Flies, when desperation, greed, and a seemingly never-ending acid trip created a perfect storm of paranoia, all ending in a moment of unspeakable violence. From Truth Media and Sony Music Entertainment, discover the brutal truth in the new season of Crooked City, The Emerald Triangle. Available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. And so are the programs that you'll find on Topic, the streaming service for true crime fans. And sure, you're thinking, Alicia, I have a ton of streaming services already. Yeah, but do any of them offer you nothing but true crime stories from around the world like Topic does? Their high quality international stories are unique and intriguing, so you aren't going to be finding the same cases you've heard over and over. Topic offers scripted shows and docuseries all inspired by real events. In my queue, the Sundance selection, The Dark Heart, about a young investigator who loses herself in the case based on the Swedish bestseller. And then there's The Missing Children. This is the story of how almost 800 children and babies' bodies were discovered on the grounds of a home for unwed mothers. As one woman said, they now had a mass grave in the west of Ireland, and the nuns are involved. Be warned, this story is not only horrifying, but will have your blood boiling. Topic is the streaming service you need if you're a true crime head. Entertain your dark side. This holiday season, get all of this content for 50% off a yearly subscription. That's only $2.49 per month for the whole year. Use code HOLIDAY22 for 50% off. That's HOLIDAY and the number 22 for a year of streaming for just $29.99. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. On September 13, 1972, a Wednesday, 20-year-old Laura Brock left her Bellingham, Washington rooming house for a two-night walkabout-slash-camping trip on the Olympic Peninsula. A note found that evening by her roommate Judy briefly sketched the trip's route and informed her that Laura would return on Friday the 15th. It is not known where she spent the night of the 13th, but it is known Laura hitchhiked the next afternoon from Bellingham, 22 miles south of the Canadian border, towards Port Townsend a small city of around 6,000 residents across the Puget Sound from Seattle. The man who had given Laura that ride reported he'd dropped her off at 2.25 p.m. in the Sharps Corner neighborhood of Anacortes, Washington, on Fidalgo Island in the Sound, which connects via Highway 20 to Whidbey Island, quote, the largest island in the state, located about 30 miles north of Seattle, lies between the Olympic Peninsula and the I-5 corridor of western Washington. Laura was a student at Western Washington State College in Bellingham, who was taking a break from school for at least the current quarter, but maybe longer, with her now more flexible schedule allowing for the impromptu trip. She thumbed for her next ride only 10 minutes before a pickup truck with a silver canopy eased to the shoulder and Laura climbed in. It was her last known sighting. That evening, two workers helping set up a carnival at Whidbey Island's Naval Air Station decided to explore a logging road in their truck just for the hell of it. It was an area often reportedly used as both a lover's lane and a trash dump. After stopping for a few minutes to talk and probably smoke some weed, man. Some ganja. 
They continued along the densely forested lane, and a little way down, their headlights revealed a pale shape sprawled in the middle of the desolate road. It was the body of Laura Brock, clad only in knee-high navy blue socks. Her clothing and underwear were located in a pile 150 feet away. Her shoes were found tossed aside in a spot even further from the body. Laura had been raped before being bludgeoned to death, killed that day sometime between her first hitch and eight that evening. The left side of her skull was crushed by a, quote, hammer-like object. Medical examiners found a few gray-brown hairs clutched in Laura's hand, which they believed came from the chest of her murderer. It was the first time introverted but strong-willed Laura Brock had ever hitchhiked. Her grandmother had warned her of the dangers, but Laura's reasoning of, it's legal now, Grandma, was the final word and all she needed to justify traveling by thumb. Laura's parents flew in from Maryland on September 19th to identify the body. There was little newspaper coverage at the time related to the killing and rape of Laura Brock. Her name only begins to appear with more frequency in connection with those later attacked or killed by her murderer. People had always hitchhiked, and it has always been dangerous. But in 1972, it became even more so, when a new state legislature was brought forth to make hitchhiking legal in the state of Washington. Hitchhiking was already seen essentially as legal until it passed on May 23rd. It helped turn the highways of the Pacific Northwest into the hunting ground we now know it to be. And I would like to say great job to everyone involved in making that happen. Yeah, was there a reasoning for that, that they were like, this is beneficial because... I, f- I feel that it was, people are doing this anyway, so we can set it up, make it legal, and they were planning also to have designated areas uh, along highways and access roads that were specifically designed for people to hitchhike and be picked up by people who were cool with that. Basically bus stops for murderers to just collect people to kill. Taking the murderer part out of it, I feel like they probably had good intention there to make it safer, having designated spots on the highway where people aren't going to get hit. When yeah, people so you're not out over. on the street. Like, like having like a safe use place for people. Right. Who use yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like it's a good intent and they know it's already happening. And you could probably argue it's better for the environment and such, but yeah, I mean, they, I, I think it, the risk outweigh the, yeah. the positives. These hippies are going to do what they want. Yeah, or if it was like a way to lessen the paperwork because they didn't want to charge people. Oh, that's a good point you know, too, like, yeah. Let's yeah. not use the resources of patrol officers to arrest people for hitchhiking and then we have to drive them in and we have to book them and da, 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 or give them a ticket or whatever. a serial killer slinking off laughing after he submits the bill to Congress. No kidding, just <laughs> rubbing his hands together. Yes, let's make it legal. It'll be like Uber, but without any documentation or background checks. Perfect. On Tuesday, May 1st, 1973, nearly eight months after the discovery of Laura Brock's body, Kathy Sue Miller, a few weeks shy of 16, was scanning through the Seattle Times classified section in an effort to find a job for her boyfriend, Mark. She circled an ad for an attendant at a local gas station and called the listed number on Mark's behalf the following morning. In the next room, Kathy's mother, Mary, overheard the conversation as she dressed for work. She heard Kathy respond in delight when the person on the other end of the phone said they were willing to hire a girl. The call lasted a little more than 10 minutes, with Kathy laughing at the things the person was putting in her ear. At the conversation's end, Kathy read off her phone number and address to the unknown party which at first unsettled Mary, and would go on to haunt her forever. After Kathy hung up the phone and filled her mother in on the job, she said the man would meet her after school that day in front of Sears, and then drive her to the gas station to fill out an application. Mary balked at this, calling out the danger of entering a stranger's car, and when Mary left to catch a bus, Kathy promised that she would not meet the man. As Mary walked to her bus stop, the talk with Kathy nagged at her, Mary turned and hustled back to where Kathy was waiting for her bus to Roosevelt High School, where she maintained good grades despite a heavy class load. They rode together. Mary was late for work, but didn't care, and she again implored Kathy to promise that she would not meet the man who placed the ad. Kathy did so before disembarking at the high school and turning back once to wave at her mom through the window. At work that morning, Mary Miller could not shake the unease she felt. It was all just wrong. Why would the gas station attendant pick her up? And what need could he have for her address? And why would they hire a girl with no experience? Mary called the Seattle Police Department and was put through to Sergeant Ed Golder, who ran the sex crimes unit. 
After Mary laid out the details of Kathy's phone conversation, Golda confirmed that it sounded hinky and said the girl should absolutely not go to the meeting spot. Mary Miller, now somewhat relieved, informed Golder that Kathy had promised she wouldn't. When Mary made it home from work that afternoon, she was at first not concerned Kathy wasn't there. She was a busy student, after all. But as the clock turned to six, then 6.30, her insides glazed with fear. Mary called the number from the WAN ad and spoke to a man who confirmed that he had talked with Kathy that morning, but she hadn't arrived to apply slash interview for the job. She called Kathy's best friend Lisa, who confirmed seeing her at school that day, as well as Mark, Kathy's boyfriend, who was unavailable. After completing his paper route, he was indisposed at an academic meeting. At eight that evening, Mary called to report Kathy missing, and by nine, two patrol officers responded and took down the details from an increasingly distraught Mary. When the officers left, she again called Mark, who had returned home. It was 10 p.m., and he admitted reluctantly to Mary that he had waited with Kathy after school in front of Sears for as long as he could before taking off. He had to leave her waiting to do his paper route, his last image of her waiting on the sidewalk, holding her school books. He told Mary he hadn't learned the name, but did hear a man was going to pick Kathy up in a purple car. Mary again called to add to the police report what Mark had told her, but she had to wait until the juvenile unit's detectives were back on shift at quarter to eight the next morning. She called back the moment it struck 7.45, speaking with Detective Marilyn McLaughlin, who said she would track down the unlisted number from the classified ad and call Mary back, which she did a few hours later, listing the business address at 7216 Aurora Avenue North and its owner's name, Harvey Kerrigan. On Friday, May 4th, 1973, homicide detectives Billy Bauman and Dwayne Homan were assigned to Kathy Miller's case. Officials were certain she was either being held against her will or out there, somewhere, lonely and possibly even deceased. And just because it's fun to imagine, Detectives Bauman and Homan were a couple of big boys. <laughs> Both stood well over six feet tall, and the two were such a tight team, their names were always mentioned in the same breath. Bauman and Homan. Bauman brought humor to their partnership, and Homan, a steady sense of pensiveness. When the detectives checked Harvey Kerrigan for a criminal record, quote, his background was enough to make their blood run cold. On July 31st, 1949, in Anchorage, Alaska, a man named John Keith was walking to his home a little past nine when he heard a noise in a small park beside the road. Spying a man and woman lying on the grass, he moved toward the couple, thinking the woman may be in danger. As he did, the man popped up from the grass and told him to keep moving. John kept walking, now feeling embarrassed he'd interrupted a consensual act of park sex. The next morning, as John Keith walked from his home toward downtown Anchorage, a strange feeling had him walking back to the little park. The encounter had rolled around in his head all night and felt different in the light. It felt wrong. Reaching the grassy area, his breath caught. The woman lay there in the open, dead, her face bruised and swollen from a beating. Clothing had been torn away, and the body was left partially nude. Quote, Death had occurred because of severe brain damage from a tremendous bludgeoning. Her face had been virtually destroyed from the chin to the forehead, bone and tissue crushed to a pulp. The weapon, or weapons, had unquestionably been human fists. Bruises on the woman's thighs and genitals spoke of an attempted rape, but there had been no penetration and no semen was present on or in the body. The corpse was identified by relatives as 57-year-old Laura Showalter, who'd been walking home from seeing a movie when she was killed. John Keith gave the U.S. Marshal assigned to the case all the information he had, which wasn't much, and the case floundered for weeks until a woman named Dorcas Callan called Anchorage Police to report that she'd been assaulted. It was morning on September 16th when the drunk soldier outside a tavern asked Dorcas to go for a ride with him as she walked by. The man, most likely stationed at nearby Fort Richardson, advanced, saying he thought he knew her. He then grabbed the woman and dragged her toward a ditch, which they tumbled into. She described his, quote, almost inhuman strength as the soldier tore at her clothes, touching her breasts and groping between her legs. Screaming, Dorcas Callan ripped herself away from the man, clawed out of the ditch, and ran for the tavern, where she called police. Dorcas's description of her attacker painted a portrait of a real fuggo, whom, lo 
haven't heard that in a minute. <laughs> oh my God. I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> Whom law enforcement found with ease. Again, because as his future public defender would go on to say, quote, he was not a movie star. Balding in his early 20s, with jowly cheeks, deep-set eyes below a spacious forehead, and a chin dimple you could shoot whiskey out of, the soldier was easy to find, and was taken into police custody later that same afternoon. Dorcas Callan picked him out of a lineup almost immediately, as did John Keith, the man who'd briefly interrupted the murder of Laura Showalter. Josh, did you see a picture of this man? Oh, many, many pictures of him. And you would concur with their description? Well, that was my that was my description. <laughs> no, I but I guess. Oh, the he was not a movie star. He was very unattractive. He just had extreme features. Oh, okay. But he was an extreme person. Well, there you go. He was more well, really like Cro Magnon looking, you know, just mm. like Neanderthal. I hope we don't offend any Neanderthals out there. <laughs> Harvey Lewis Kerrigan was placed under arrest for assault to commit rape and housed at Anchorage City Jail. Fresh out of reform school, he had enlisted in the U.S. Army at age 18 and now, at 22, was stationed at Fort Richardson. Kerrigan was interviewed the next day by United States Marshal Paul Herring in an office adorned with pictures of Jesus and various saints, which the marshal indicated before telling his prisoner God might find him in higher regard if he was truthful in his statements. Kerrigan eventually detailed and signed a confession after consulting with a priest and hearing from the marshal that he, quote, had known men that had been at the prison on McNeil Island and learned a trade and that made something of their lives. In the written statement, Harvey admitted to taking Laura Showalter to the park and beating her with his fists until she stopped moving, after she refused him sex. Now discharged from the army, Harvey went on trial in early 1950. His confession was the clincher, and he was subsequently convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death by hanging. It was reported that night after sentencing, Kerrigan was heard sobbing in his cell. In December 1950, Harvey's case was sent to appeal on a technicality, where it was eventually presided over by the Supreme Court of the United States. When first arrested, he was brought before a judge, charged for the attack on Dorcas Cowan, and advised of his rights. But uh-oh, Harvey was taken to Marshal Herring before being charged with Laura Showalter's murder and advised of his rights in this other case, thus violating the McNabb rule, which protected the accused from self-incrimination. As a result, Kerrigan's death sentence was struck down. He was, however, convicted of the crimes against Dorcas Callan, receiving a 15-year sentence for assault and attempted rape. He was transferred from the jail in Seward, Alaska, to McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary to serve his time but he remained there only four months before another transfer to Alcatraz. Harvey was later paroled in April of 1960, having served only nine of the 15 years. Again, no one could look and go, oh, he could come up for parole right now for this attack. Oh, he was actually found guilty of murder, but let's not worry about that. Well, I'm guessing they don't have a computer system back then. I know. You're just like (sighs) banking on people having a complete paper trail every time they're transferred, which is highly unlikely. Well, I'm sick of it. (laughs) Oh, I know. Can you imagine being the bonehead that screwed that up? Like, (sighs) do you get in trouble at work? No. Harvey then moved to Duluth, Minnesota, home of a half-brother, and was arrested four months later for burglary and assault to commit rape. A lack of evidence killed the rape charge, but he was sentenced to nearly six years in Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas. In a prison interview, Kerrigan said, regarding his attempts at a straight life, quote, I worked, I had a job, and I couldn't take it. I'd quit and go get another job. And one night, I just said to hell with it, and my brother and I went and robbed the place. Well, we robbed quite a few, I guess, but we just got caught for the one. Paroled early, Harvey moved to Seattle, home of another half-brother, in March of 1964. Making it on the outside for only eight months, before an arrest in November for second-degree burglary. Again sentenced to 15 years, Harvey was freed on parole four years later after earning good time. His police record noted that he was, quote, capable of superhuman strength. In 1969, a parole violation sent Harvey to Walla Walla for a year. After serving his time, and now back in Seattle in 1972, Harvey met Alice Johnson, appropriately, at the Meet Me There Tavern 
They were married on April 2nd, 1972, and their union faltered from the start. Harvey began to beat Alice's 11-year-old son, Billy, and also became fixated on her teenage daughter, Georgia. Within months, Billy was sent to live with his father in California, and Georgia was soon to follow, leaving the area to join her dad and brother after an incident in which she and Harvey were alone in the house, and he silently hoisted her up and began carrying her to the primary bedroom. She begged him to stop, slamming her fists into his shoulder and invoking the devastation her mother would feel to discover Harvey's true nature. Harvey apologized to Georgia and released her. Shortly after, she ran away and made it to safety, far from Harvey's gaze and his terrifying strength. Laura Brock would be raped and murdered in September, only five months later. Okay, back to the present of Friday, May 4th, 1973, and Detectives Bauman and Homan are on the case. Harvey had not shown up for work at the Save More station that day. He was located later at his home and asked to speak with detectives at the police station. Harvey agreed. During the interview, he made a statement that he had set a time with Kathy Miller to interview for the attendant job, but she hadn't shown up. When they located him at his house, police found it pretty interesting to see Harvey's car in his driveway because he drove a 1966 maroon Oldsmobile Toronado, a detail that matched Kathy's boyfriend's information about a purple car being involved in the meetup. Detectives then spoke to Kerrigan's most recent parole officer, who said, quote, When things are going right, Harvey's a decent person. But when things aren't going right, he turns into an animal. If you have to arrest him, he'll be dangerous. He won't go easy. The sum of it all was disconcerting, but failed to reach the mark of probable cause, meaning no search warrant, for now. Hoping to get enough evidence to be able to make the arrest, stakeout detectives began to surveil Harvey's home and business. The Monday following Kathy's disappearance, the 7th, the media was informed and her photo and description were printed in local newspapers. The next day, a call came in on Mary Miller's unlisted phone number, but it was unrelated to the news coverage. The caller had found it written inside a school book. The man was an employee of the Everett Plywood Company in Everett, around 30 miles north of Seattle. The stack of books, algebra, and German, and Kathy's social security card were found, quote, on a ledge abutting the company's parking lot by one of the employees. This happened on May 3rd at 4 p.m., the day after Kathy had last been seen. It had rained and the books were wet, so the employee who found them wiped them dry, destroying any prints that may have been left behind. Bauman and Homan searched the area surrounding the plywood company for evidence of Harvey and Kathy, but found nothing of note. Detectives interviewed Kerrigan at his gas station, located at 75th and Aurora in Seattle. After explaining they were there investigating Kathy Miller's disappearance, Harvey was read his rights. He claimed he'd been too busy running the station on May 2nd to have even met up with Kathy. He again admitted that they had spoken on the phone that day during lunch and confirmed to police the meetup time of 2.30. Harvey further stated he did drive to the Sears in his Oldsmobile, but he only had a few minutes to wait for Kathy before he had to leave to grab some auto parts, which he did without her, as she hadn't shown up. Detective Homan asked if Harvey would take a polygraph test, and he at first agreed before voicing concern and backing out. He wanted to talk to his lawyer. Candy Erling, 17, worked at Harvey's gas station for only a week, but it was a crucial one. She was working the day Kathy Miller disappeared, and gave a statement to police that Harvey left around 2.25 that day to pick up some auto parts, and then called 45 minutes later to say he would be a while longer because he had to drive to another auto parts store. Candy said he returned between 6.30 and 6.45 that evening, and had even given her a ride home, though she hadn't seen Harvey unload any parts when he returned, nor did she see any in his car. Kerrigan had fired Candy for stealing from the register, which she denied, saying she had actually seen him dip his hand in the till on multiple occasions. She thought the firing was the result of her turning him down for sex on multiple occasions. Detectives Bauman and Homan spoke to the owner of the Texaco station across the street from Harvey's station, who said, quote, I saw Harvey at 7 a.m. on May 3rd, and he was getting out of his purple Toronado. He looked totally wasted, and I assumed he'd had another fight with his wife and slept in the car all night. When he got out of his car, he had a blanket around his shoulders. 
He looked as if he hadn't slept all night. He had big, dark circles under his eyes, and his face was all dragged out. Police surveillance of Harvey Kerrigan, his business, and home continued as the investigation's focus narrowed in on the one-time death row inmate. On May 23rd, Kathy Miller's 16th birthday, Seattle papers ran articles about the mystery and featured a photo of a smiling Kathy alongside her surveillance photo of a scowling Harvey. This amplified Harvey's hatred toward lead investigators Bauman and Homan, the danger of which both knew. Kerrigan had guerrilla strength he'd once shown off to his lawyer, Russell Kruger, by doing one-armed chin-ups for two hours straight in his cell as they spoke. That doesn't seem possible. How scary. In the Miller home that day sat a new 10-speed bike, which Kathy's mother, Mary, had promised her as a birthday gift. Mary bought the bike in the period of the disappearance, feeling it would be giving up hope not to. On the advice of legal counsel, Harvey refused to take a polygraph test. And though it sounds impossible, detectives noted he somehow looked more haggard than normal. He was unshaven, twitchy, and had an unslept look about him. Soon after, Bauman and Homan received intel from some of their informants regarding Harvey Kerrigan. Word was their suspect was, quote, clearing up his affairs in the Seattle area, saying goodbye to acquaintances and talking of moving back to Minnesota, which the detectives could do nothing to stop. A body was discovered on a Tualip reservation, 40 miles north of Seattle, on Sunday, June 3, 1973, by two 16-year-olds on motorbikes. The boys, who lived on the reservation, had propped their bikes and were picking berries along the roadside when the wind carried death across their noses. One of the teens walked into the brush, and peering in as deep as possible, he could see a figure wrapped in black plastic sheeting, I'd think something akin to a thick garbage bag. They left on their bikes, leaving behind what they were certain to be a body, and hauling ass to the Tualip Tribal Office, which contacted the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office to coordinate its retrieval and identification. The body was nude and decomposed to the point that its genitalia could not be identified. Quote, the victim lay on its side, one hand tucked beneath the chin, as if he or she had only lain down in the woods for a nap. The left cheekbone was fractured, and on the left rear of the skull, Coroner Lori Hudson found a large, crushed area, and on the right rear, typified the two nickel-sized holes in her skull. Death had occurred at least a month before from heavy weapon trauma. According to Hudson, after the first strike to the head, Kathy would have lost consciousness and been dead within moments. The plastic sheeting wrapped around her was found to match the kind Harvey used to wrap out-of-service pumps, but it was not from the same lot. The tears didn't match up. A pathologist's comparison of the teeth to dental records confirmed with a matching and somewhat unusual outside molar filling that the body was, in fact, Kathy Miller's. Detectives Bauman and Homan went to Mary Miller's home to inform her of the body's positive ID. Before leaving, they swore to work on the case for as long as it took, quote, as long as we're policemen. Bauman and Homan clocked the drive from the front of the Sears to the location of Kathy's body at 42 miles each way, and they also discovered a friend of Harvey's happened to live a little over a mile from the body site, and it was reported he once owned property on the reservation. A friend of Kerrigan, who'd been a guest in his home in the week after Kathy Miller disappeared, theorized to him that she was most likely a runaway and would pop back into the world soon. Quote, and Harvey, he says, I'll kiss your ass if she turns up alive. Detective Homan spoke with another of the Save More Station's employees, who advised him to strike first if they were going to arrest Harvey, and to avoid Kerrigan's iron claw hands. He would crush them if given half a chance. A different employee told the detectives Harvey had shown him a ball-peen hammer, and said it was to take care of Bauman and Homan. Quote, he wants to crush your heads before he leaves. On the evening of June 19th, Bauman and Homan were granted a warrant for Kerrigan's Oldsmobile Toronado. As it was getting hitched to a tow truck, Harvey drove up in his pickup, leaped out of the vehicle furious, and approached the scene. He glared at Detective Homan, then returned to his truck and reached inside, possibly for a weapon. Bauman unholstered his revolver in view of Kerrigan, who saw this, stopped reaching, and brought out his hands, empty. Sweat was streaming down Harvey's face. Continuing in his furious way, Harvey roared, What's going on? Homan said, We have a warrant. Harvey said, 
You could have searched my car any time you wanted. No need for a warrant. Detective Homan asked, Are you leaving town, Harvey? And Harvey said he was going to Denver for a few days to look for work. And as the car is being towed away, Detective Homan said to Harvey, We'll be seeing you. Crime lab criminalists found no trace of Kathy Miller in the vehicle. There was a woman's palm print identified on the inside of the passenger window, but it could not be matched to Kathy. While a technician was able to retrieve her fingerprints at examination, the palm area was too far gone to process. Harvey never got around to crushing Bauman and Homan's heads, but he did leave the state, abandoning his Oldsmobile to authorities and moseying away to live with relatives in Minnesota, confident that the detectives had nothing with which to bring him down, and he was right for the time being. Boy, that would be frustrating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know he's just this monster who has already been let go of death row. Mm. In Seattle, Detectives Bauman and Holman prepared and sent a dossier to the Minneapolis Police Department. It contained summaries of Laura Brock and Kathy Miller's murders and thoroughly detailed Harvey's substantial but circumstantial connections to their deaths. The dossier was received by a police department clerk and filed away with no follow-up. Next week, I'll conclude the story of Harvey Kerrigan, how it would take more bodies and a few fortunate survivors to connect Harvey's wrecking ball life to those they believe were brutalized at his hands. We'll also talk about a map of Harvey's the police found that was covered in nearly 200 areas marked with red circles, and how one of those marks matched a body site, and then another one did, and then another. And we'll see how long Pure Evil can keep someone alive. Spoiler. It's a very long time. Wow, he's a creep. I gotta look at these pictures of him. Oh yeah, he's he's a he's yeah. It reminds me. I mean, even though it's horrible, many many years apart. Just the importance of the parole board looking at the full scope of things. Yeah, doing like a math problem instead of looking at the person. Instead of just the one situation, mm-hmm. because. It should be equal, like, look at the one situation. Oh, this person has a totally clean record. Of course they can be paroled. They have a family waiting for them. They have a job set up. They have a housing. It's all good. Oh, this guy. Oh, he was technically on death row and then had it thrown out. So he was a murderer. Yeah, they act as though that erases the crime. Yeah. It's like it doesn't matter anymore. Like he was convicted of it. And he should have still been there. (sighs) Yeah, that's very frustrating. So many victims. The amount of victims that shouldn't exist because of things like that. That people that should have been put away or at least on a radar or something is like, oof. Just if he had been forced to serve his full sentences every time he was convicted. Yeah. He Well, he at least would have passed by Laura Brock and Kathy right. Miller. Right. Uh, time-wise. Yeah. I honestly, I think of the families and I just, I don't know how they can... Well, I guess you don't carry it, but I don't know how I wouldn't carry that anger at just the time and the how many people in a way are responsible. Obviously, he's the one physically responsible for it, but there's a, it took a lot of mistakes to put him in that place at that time at other people's hands. Which unfortunately happens way so too, often. Way too much. Was there a lot of prison overcrowding, do you know, in like the 70s? Is it like when the populations just like mm. explode? I wonder if that's when they started like really letting people out early. Yeah, maybe. We did go through that in Oregon. Mm-hmm. I can't recall if that was the timeline, but that sounds familiar. I'd rather you keep out like white collar crimes and like let them out or let out people nonviolent crimes, but rape and and assault, like that's scary. Possession? Let someone out. Possess- oh, you yeah. had some weed? Oh, you had some coke? Oh, you had whatever? Okay. Which was supposed to be the goal of the law that we just had that passed last year or whatever. But Ugh. we just hear this too much. I think when it's a violent crime, there, sh- you sh- there should be no letting out early to me. Well, speaking on this topic. Yeah. Um, our have la- updates. I have updates. So last week's episode. It's my birthday. <laughs> Last week's episode, Unprecedented, got a lot of people talking, a lot of people reaching out to us. So in the episode, I had mentioned that Richard Gilmore, uh, the jogger rapist, from his prison, 
contacted one of the victims and made a threat. And uh, Danielle had emailed me to say, hey, that was Colleen. So Colleen is, in, there's a picture of her in the blog. She was one of the uh, survivors who spoke at many of his hearings as well. And he basically called, threatened her when she was living in another state at the time. And she reported it to Portland authorities. And they checked his cell and they found a list with names of the victims and their relatives. And Jeez. all he got was a loss of phone privileges. So, uh, yeah. And what? how is he doing that? It's like, shouldn't there be like a loss of socializing or something? Because he's obviously yeah, how is connected he, to yeah, someone. I don't know. Maybe they have phone books in their library or so. Take those away. I don't know. But I'm like, okay, so he not only had a guard quit over how he acted. Uh -huh. He th he threatened Tiffany. He threatened Colleen. And I'm sure he's threatened. Somebody overheard him threatening Danielle. So how is that not a factor and in, he's in still the parole board? being released at exactly. the lowest level. Uh -huh. Being released at all yep. would be upsetting. So another thing that came up was a little bit about why Richard Gilmore originally got that release date. Um, we talked about how his sentence was cut in half and that he kept doing parole hearings. He eventually stopped, but then they just set a date. And I wanted to kind of circle back about that. So when he was convicted, there was this thing called good time date. And that just meant when your time was up, the parole board had a right to set this good time date. And if you got out on that date, you didn't really have any supervision. You could just go free. So what happened uh, by giving him an early parole date, we could actually supervise him. So when when the gals were like, he needs to be kept in prison or he needs a higher uh, sex offender level, Kate Brown was basically like, well, at least we're going to supervise him. So I kind of get that. It just sucks that there isn't more that she could be doing with that. Yeah, I had seen that, like, basically he's going to have to check in more frequently than right. the average person at his level and, like be tracked or something like that but then why not change his status i know why I know. have him at the lowest status and go but we got to do some of these high-end things because it's a security concern i know and it's like i i get what she's saying being like well at least he's going to be supervised but at the same time it's like eh, i don't know i don't think the people that have gone to every parole hearing would agree with you on that like he is more dangerous than that weren't informed yeah and then the last thing we wanted to bring up is this week, as in tomorrow, what's the date on Wednesday? Uh, the 30th. The 30th. There's going to be a peaceful protest. Uh, yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Leash? Yeah. So I believe it was Tiffany had posted it that um, someone put together on Facebook an event and you can join us. This is coming out on Tuesday, the 29th of November, uh, and this will be tomorrow, Wednesday. I will definitely be down there. Uh, Emily's going to try to get out of work a little bit and be able to join us. And it's basically to just show that we support these survivors and support their right as much as his rights uh, to be informed and uh, also make voices heard that his classification should be changed. And I think it's kind of a generalized thing of like this whole thing is fucked. <laughs> yeah. Like every part of this case is messed up, but yeah. it's also uh, just to really show them the support you know I know Tiffany's going to be there I'm not sure who else but it's we've had a lot of people reaching out I think maybe more than any other episode for this people are outraged that this is happening people from other states are like hey I don't even know who Kate Brown is but I called her office and said you know you have to fix this get it together yeah exactly so um yeah a lot of people are really pissed yeah. about this I'm proud, of our, I'm proud of our listeners about yeah that. you guys are awesome because it's not just I mean it's it's twofold of these women who were already victimized from him are now being victimized again by the judi judicial system for letting him out and not mm -hmm. letting them know and also we have to protect each other because we what does his age matter this dude hasn't stopped being violent towards them or threatening violence towards them why would we think he would stop when he's out so it's like spreading the word right if they're not going to let people know that he's out we have to let people know and they're trying to say like oh his age makes him less of a factor um you know whether he can't get it up or something but the the girls were talking about well when he couldn't get hard 
he became more violent. Which is very common. Right. So I think there should be concern there. Yeah. If he feels the desire to go Mm -hmm. and do this and he cannot complete, what's he going to do then? Yeah. And okay, so uh, do you know how old he's going to be? 63. Okay. That's not that old. And I've had boyfriends older. Just kidding. (laughs) You wish. (laughs) But, you know, what what has he been doing in prison this whole time? Working out constantly? Making threats. And just getting stronger. I doubt he's like a frail, sickly little 63-year-old man. I mean, you guys, one of these women moved out of state because he's getting out. It is that serious. He's threatened her life. Like, this is a big deal. And that's why I'm glad our listeners are outraged. Everyone should be outraged. And people need to know about it. A random question, too, that someone had asked, I believe, on Instagram. um, Do you happen to know, and it caught my ear when I heard it, do you know why there was a difference or or like a point difference if it was that victims were male? I I think I'm guessing that is like a psychological thing that if Mm. you victimize a male, it might mean more violence. I'm not sure. Okay. I haven't really dug into that, but I was I was surprised by it. Yeah. I, I don't know if that makes them because there's kind well, of an archaic vibe to it of it like is. if he's a homo homosexual then he's definitely going to be more violent and awful. Then like, again, I think about these, uh, you know, like the child rapists of Washington when he he couldn't help himself. His victims were all male. I don't know if it's like left over from the eighties or right. something, but I found that very odd. So if anyone does know yeah. exactly why somebody is maybe more familiar with that static 99 test yeah. please reach out because then you know. think too it's like well then why wouldn't it be because right. that would be scarier if like oh this person didn't care it was male it's, female but, whoever i think you're right i think it's archaic and i think that's yet another reason why we cannot base this off of a single yeah. 10 question form yeah why are these women two points less we need to be looking at what did he actually complete in prison to yeah. better himself what has he been doing in prison making yeah. threats that should be those should be points yeah you should get a point for every infraction you uh-huh. had in there. Like that is bullshit. Yeah. Did you have? Yeah. Did you make contact or threats with your victims while in prison? Ten points. And listen, I am one of the first people now, after a few years of doing this, to say that there are people who are rehabilitated. I totally. know people who went to prison and who do good with their life now. He is not one of them. And in my core, I am. I, I try to be a believer of. This person did their time and they are trying to have their second chance. But he also didn't do his time. You know, like he served the time that was cut in half and cut in half and cut in half and Mm -hmm. paroled. And And uh, because of the statute, he would have had how many other rapes on his. Exactly. And then looking at the details of the crimes he did commit, how is he exactly not being a three? I know we're looking at the static 99, but why are we not considering the fact that he raped children? In their own in homes. In their own homes after committing voyeurism yeah. and burglarizing. Now we're getting all pissed off again. I am pissed off and you, everyone should be. And that's why we're here. But yeah. anyway, join. Alicia will definitely be there Wednesday in Salem. Yeah. I'm going to try my best. It is in the middle of my work day, so I'll see what I can do. Uh, but I'll be there in spirit if I don't arrive and um, look for the Murder in the Rain t-shirt and come say hi. Yeah. And hopefully, well, Tiffany will definitely be there. I yeah. don't know who else will be, but you'll have to talk to her and say hi for me. And I'm excited for next week because I'm very intrigued by Josh's little cliffhanger there of oh finding my God. a map covered in dots where bodies had been what? found. And what kind of moron does that? Like, here, guy, here's my treasure map. God, idiot. Oh, there's, yeah, there's just so many strange elements. There's a crime that he gets accused of and identified by the by the victim. It's not a murder or a rape, but some other huge crime. And he, people aren't sure still if he if he's connected to it or not, but it happened in the time of all of these killings. So just a very weird other thing. I probably will cut this out, but teasies. <laughs> we love a good teasy. Indeed. I can work with that. You can work with that. I can work, I can with, work that. with that. You know, if you swallow that up, you're gonna burp it. Oh, I no. I well, first off, I burp constantly. Secondly, yeah, we know. I don't. I don't swallow it. I, I don't. 
I don't pop the top off the soda can. I slowly turn the lid. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to let the air out slowly. That sounds exhausting. I just do it all Are at once. Are you like a butt cheek lifter? <laughs> Who did the fart? I did the fart. Apologies in advance for all of our voices. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Oh my god, you guys are so mean. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. It's for the record, time. I was not tooting when I was coughing. That was Josh's mouth. Scallywag. Armpit and butt only. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> are we still talking about farts? Mm -hmm. Hello, is someone brushing his Is there teeth? a rabbit or something over here? Ma'am? It was my quack chop. I'm flowy. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> a little old lady in church. <laughs> it's my pepper. It's to my peppermint. It's quieter my... if I do it extremely I need... slowly. <laughs> I need my lozenge. I can't. I'm gonna cough during the hymnal <gasps> unless <gasps> I take the lozenge. I'm the only joke on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> birthday gang bang. <laughs> hey like, I asked you to stop with the jokes. I'll take it. <laughs> Not that kind of gangbang. No! <laughs> the kind with Shex. No! <laughs> <laughs> the worst kind. Carrot. Carrot top? Carrot top. Was oh my God. I knew he was bad. I never liked him. And that trade made something of their life. God in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> He's back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> he then moved to. <sighs> My cousin worked at Neiman Marcus in Vegas for years and said that he was like the most prolific customer. Like she didn't sell make more makeup to anyone else in town but Carrot Top. Stop. That's what it's like living with me, Em. It's true. I'm so sorry. Every time? Yeah, nah, not every. I, I'm trying to stop. Why? I'm sorry, Henry. I oh, I feel like it's addicting and annoying, but it's not. <laughs> Is it because I told you you were aggressive with your farts that one time? Yes. <gasps> no. It's Wait, it was real fart? Apparently, I was being aggressive with well, my farts when I was, was recovering one... from surgery because I was in a lot of pain. Oh, you were like he pushing him out? Well, he was just, he was very irritable and he was healing and he was not oh, sleeping he well. he was aggressive when he farted. And I guess. Well, I had just aggress. asked. I had just asked. <laughs> <laughs> I had asked him to tone it down just a little because they were, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't being used for joke anymore. They were weaponized frankly like, wait his, <laughs> his fart mouth sounds not intentionally aggressive? no my real no, ones no his real fart. what the f what does it? that mean were yeah. you like squeezing him hard no he, I don't no, know. no 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 normally it's like if he farts it's like he's walking out the door and he'll like fart before he leaves and we'll laugh about it whatever this was like he just there wasn't even a joke to it kind of a thing it was just like real hardcore he'd be on the couch and just rip ass or like I mean, he'd he walk, was recovering he'd walk by my thank face. you emily <laughs> he'd walk by my face and no fart. i did not <laughs> and it was like, i did not hello <laughs> no <It's> like <laughs> all of his built up uh, did I do aggression that? at you he like and saved so, and so like and i was being very understanding <laughs> that he was healing did i he do that in your face well and so Would you I, answer me, please? <laughs> <laughs> Did I do that? And so I told him. Oh, my him, God. I said, hey, I know you're not feeling great, and I know that you're feeling feeling irritable and your body's healing, but, like, maybe less aggression with the farts, and he's been offended ever since. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm sorry. But I never said I didn't want you to do your farts. Your Just do it in the fart. garage where the cats fart. <laughs> hmm. I think maybe I should start farting into like a <laughs> pile of old towels or something. No, oh my god, that's not. What Do you think happened. anyone's done that to like come back and to look at smell it, smell them later? Oh like, yeah. my god, no, that's to not see what if I they meant. actually leave a smell. I don't know. Have <laughs> you? No, but now I want to try. Ah! Join us on Patreon <laughs> for fart towel stack. Back to the business. Sorry about those farts. No, stop it. We, oh, this, we you're going to have to apologize oh, every pill. anniversary. Oh, it's my birthday. Stop it. I know. <laughs> I didn't want to have this conversation. I liked it. I was just so confused by what exactly an aggressive fart was. Yeah, I know. It, it, it sounds like something that would hurt someone's feelings. Well, I picture when you like have but gas and you're just trying really hard to push it out. No, I rash. meant my feelings. <laughs> I'm just trying to re reconfigure a sentence in my mind. Oh, God. That sounds like poetry. 
reconfigure a sentence in my mind. I like that you said poetry and then we both just sang it. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't talked this much in months. He won't talk to me. (laughs) It's because of the aggressive Because of the farts. I'm sorry. I recognize that that was a tough time for us. And I was also feeling extra sensitive. I wasn't meaning to uh, offend you by setting a personal boundary. (laughs) Does that sound real? Yeah. (laughs) I'm calling my therapist. (laughs) Here, I've got him on the phone right here. (laughs) (laughs) It was an aggressive fart. Which unfortunate or well, anyway, looking forward to that. I guess there's a yeah, there's so many elements to the next part of the story. Like, I uh, know <laughs> I'm a ma'am, I'm we're asshole. recording. I figure you can just cut mine out, yeah, though, you know, but it carries. I over. will, I will. Bye. No, can you finish that sentence? Just say there's so many elements to next week. Oh, what was it though? Just there's so many elements to next week's story. Reconfigure a sentence in my mind. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>